Hello, and welcome to the Metabolic Classroom. I am Professor Ben Bickman, a biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. Thanks for joining me for the episode today for this lesson. In today's lesson, we're going to be discussing the confluence of two metabolic epidemics, each in their own right, a substantial problem, and when combined, the problem is multiplied, and that is sarcopenic obesity. Now, let's tease that apart. Sarco sarcopenic obesity is a single problem. But as I mentioned, there are two problems in there, and you can hear them. So sedentary, you know, total bed rest, for example, all of those can be instances or causes rather of losing muscle mass. And then, of course, the obesity part of this problem is obvious, um, not only to the eye, but to the brain, where you understand what obesity is. It's simply when the body has accumulated too much fat mass. Now, we're going to touch on that in a little more detail, as I have discussed before, as much as we implicate body fat as being problematic or causal to metabolic problems like insulin resistance, uh, it's not the mass of the fat that matters most, but rather the size of each individual fat cell. So there's a little bit of nuance there, and we're going to discuss that, of course. We'll highlight that during the lesson today. Okay, so you know what sarcopenic obesity is. It is the body that is both getting excessively fat while losing its lean mass. Um, this is estimated in a study by Gao et al. 2021, and this will be in the show notes that you can find. It's estimated that within older adults, this is affecting over 10%. So not an, not an inconsequential number of people have this happening worldwide. And of course, as we continue as a population to live quite long and metabolic disturbances are starting earlier in life, and the relevance of that will be discussed soon as an origin of sarcopenic obesity. It's no surprise and fully expected that these numbers are going to continue to go up. Now, how does one thing that makes sarcopenic obesity unique is that it's not, um, why is it less common than just straight up obesity, for example, is that normally as a person gains weight, as they go from lean to obese, yes, they are very obviously gaining fat mass, but they also are less obviously gaining muscle mass. After all, every act of living now requires more, uh, meets more resistance than it did before the person had gained such a substantial amount of fat mass. So the very act of getting up and moving around, let alone climbing a flight of stairs or going on a walk or anything more long, longer, uh, the muscles are challenged more. Um, and thus, very typically, like I said, the same person who is obese tends to have more muscle mass than their leaner counterpart. So then we would just call that problem obesity, and there's no sarcopenia there. So it's the sarcopenia part that makes this less common. It's not uncommon for someone to be overweight or obese. It is much less common for someone to have sarcopenia. Again, it's typically in those three states I mentioned earlier, the very aged among us or the diseased or the very related to this disuse, the people under like true bed rest or, or very near total bed rest, so very, very sedentary people. They're going to be the ones who experience the sarcopenia. Sarcopenic obesity is likely going to continue to be a topic of conversation just because of, in part, what all of the societal lockdowns caused, where you did have a lot of people, particularly younger people, who had suddenly become more sedentary than they had ever been and at home more than they'd ever been, where most people tend to snack more and just eat junk food. So what is the relevance of muscle in this? Because uh, the loss of muscle, as we're going to discuss in a moment, really ends up compounding this problem. Muscle is the main consumer of blood glucose or blood sugar. Uh, and if, in fact, it's not even close. So when you eat a meal, and let's imagine you were wearing a continuous glucose monitor, and you see that glucose come up and then come down, 80% of that drop in blood glucose is because of what's going into muscle. So muscle is by far the main consumer of blood glucose. It is eating the lion's share of all of the glucose. So if you start to lose muscle mass, you have lost your greatest glucose consumer. You're losing your greatest glucose consumer. And thus, it's no surprise that with a drop in muscle mass comes a substantial drop in the ability of the person to control their glucose. So the drop in muscle is leading to a rise in blood glucose levels, certainly a much longer time in turning the glucose back down to normal after we've spiked it. 